Samuel has flown in from Hanover and he's just about to fly back out to Asia and in between he's learnt it's a very long taxi ride from Heathrow. <laughs> Samuel, in international competitive, something after the last presentation we are hugely aware of. Over to you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Samuel. Um, yeah, I am Brazilian, but I live and work in Germany, so I could try to answer questions for several countries. Um, and today when I came here, I talked to two people, and the first question was is agribenchmark. You know? So I guess from, from the trade perspective or from the macro level perspective, agribenchmark is still something new. So um, I want you to use maybe one or two minutes to explain some what we do just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, just to be very clear, um, uh, AgriBenchmark came to play because we realized in 2006 that there are a lot of people trying to find production costs. So production costs something very hard to find and reliable data is even harder. And if you go outside of Europe or the US, then it gets almost impossible. So the idea is to have um, comparable uh, standardized production cost data. Uh, and for that, we, we use uh, our own method. So we develop a method to, to collect data worldwide. We use national partners, so we don't collect the data ourselves. And just so as an example, in the in UK, our, our national partner is the University of Cambridge. And um, yeah, and we collect data from typical farms. So on the presentation, I will be talking about competitiveness and farm competitiveness. And I just want to make clear that I'm not going to talk about the whole competitiveness because that's, that's very hard. I will be focused on farm level and being able to produce outputs, so wheat, corn, soybeans, at the lowest price. So that's, that's the type of competitiveness I'm talking about. Uh, so that's uh, a kind of... Um, yeah, diff you could also talk about supply chain, so I'm talking about the farm level. Um, yeah, just before we start, AgriBenchmark has the coverage in all those countries you can see in green. Uh, so we cover most of the, the major players, and we cover all crops that you can imagine of that are commercial crops. So from sugar beets to sugar cane to cacao and everything you can imagine. And just throughout the presentation, I will be discussing about uh, typical farms. So those are not census data. They are typical farm data, model farms data. And uh, just for you to understand, I have here on the right side an example of a farm in Germany. So throughout the presentation, all farms will be named as the first two letters are the country, the numbers are the acreage, and the two, and two or three letters are the, the region. And all those farms, they should be interpreted as a, as a start case and they are on the hotspots of production of each country. Um, yeah, just to give you an example, I've heard a lot today about Russia and Ukraine and Brazil. And here, just to show you where we have typical farms in Ukraine and in Russia. So you see here, uh, that's what we try to do. We try to depict the production systems and production costs in a, in, a, in a specific region. I will not go through the details here, but just to show you that when I talk about Russia or Ukraine, I'm talking about few regions and not about the whole country. I think that's important for, for understanding. Yeah, so the question is how profitable is or are producing wheat and corn and uh, who are the cost leaders? So. What we have here then, we can put everybody on the same graph. So here we have Australia, Canada, Germany, France, UK, Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. So what you see here is, first of all, those are yields and, and tons per hectare. So what you see is that there is a very big difference in yields. Uh, you have countries producing very intensive, very intensive systems like European countries, and you have countries producing kind of low yield um, systems like Canada, Australia, and Russia, uh, and Ukraine. And um, the good thing about uh, having AgriBenchmark is also that you can try to explain a little bit of why. You know? So here we have input of nitrogen per hectare. So you see that 
Europeans or German farms are much more intensive and in using of inputs, whereas in Canada and Australia you might have much lower uh, use of nitrogen, for instance. Russia and Ukraine is always a bit more complex to get data that is, tells you the whole picture. And here what we have, um, it shows that there is a very big difference in, in types of farms. So for instance here, if you compare the two Russian farms, the one uh, in the right side, the 21,000 hectare farm is an agro-holding farm with Western uh, type of, of management. So you can see that can al they can also achieve yields of, of six tons of, of wheat per hectare. So there is a very big range of, of types of farming. So, uh, and there are also differences in input use that they have. Um, yeah, and here if we look at costs, so um, those are wheat costs, and it's the cost to produce one ton of wheat in one hectare here, uh, so dollars, dollars per ton. And here what we see is that um, when we, we compare in ton per ton basis, countries are much more similar. So even though Canada, Australia, they have much lower yields, they also invest proportionally, so the cost per tons are very similar. And um, just to explain, because we're going to use that for the whole presentation, direct costs here are crop protection, seeds and fertilizer, and operating costs, we account for everything, depreciation and, and family labor as well. And land costs are either uh, on land, the opportunity costs, or handles. So what we can see is that, um, as it was discussed before, Russia and Ukraine, they can produce at very low costs, uh, at least uh, in some of the type of farmings they have but they also face a much lower farm gate prices. So those prices are farm gate prices. So what you see is that they also have much lower farm prices. And that makes uh, a big of a difference when you compare it to other crops like soybean and corn, as we will see later on. And just to have an idea, most of farms are able to produce wheat between 160 and 250 dollars per ton. Um, and if we look that will be here a kind of a medium term perspective because we have to pay for, for land costs and all the inputs. But here I also brought some pictures on or some graphs on the cash costs. So those will be very short term. I have to pay my employee, I have to pay for the inputs. So those are short term costs, so cash costs. And you see that most farms will be able to produce uh, wheat with less than $150 per ton. Uh, some of the UK farms are with some of high costs, what we, we see here, and we see the Russian farms being equal or below $100 per ton. So that would be the, the cost that they would have, or short-term costs to produce one ton of wheat. Here in the green dots, you see the influence of the couple payments, so direct payments. You see that it makes yeah, European farmers kind of more uh, or increases the income of farms, so it makes sense. That is the, the purpose of the, of, of the policy, anyhow. Mo changing now for corn, so what we see, what we saw in wheat is that Russia and Ukraine are also cost leaders in wheat, and corn we have a much more diverse picture. Here we have also Argentina coming to play, uh, in Brazil, Canada, US, Russia and Ukraine again. And uh, yeah, and every time I talk about corn, I, I see people comparing a lot corn in Brazil, corn in the US, and I guess it's, it's clear to everybody, at least after the presentation from Jack, that there is a big difference in what type of corn we are talking about in Brazil. So here we have this farm in Brazil, and it's in, in Mato Grosso. So this is second season corn, so that's why you have yields of below of six tons per hectare. If you go to the south of Brazil, you might find farmers producing nine to 10 tons per hectare, similar to what you see in the US, if that will be the first, first season corn. Um, what we see here is that there is a big difference between uh, all countries in the US and Canada, US and Canada being very high yielding uh, production systems. And, uh, and when we look at costs, so the key cost here, what we see is Argentina comes as a very strong player, uh, being able to produce corn with less than 100 
dollars per ton, and that accounting for full cost. So they are very um, strong in producing corn. Uh, Argentina has a very different way of operating, uh, of mechanizing. They have a lot of uh, contractors, which makes machinery costs much lower if you compare, for instance, the, the dark blue. And, uh, and Russia also is also very strong in producing corn, and they can also produce corn with less than $120 per ton. Um, corn prices, they vary a lot. If you look at Brazil, for instance, they are much lower Argentina. Um, there's a lot of transportation costs going on here. So from this farm in Brazil, we have to transport the corn almost 2,000 kilometers. So usually what we say is you have to pay the same price you pay for one ton of corn, you pay for handling transportation. So that's why you see in the U.S. here much higher uh, farm gate prices of, of corn. And uh, if now I move to, to oil seeds. So um, oil seeds, then I will look in soybeans and rapeseed, because I think those are the, the two major crops besides palm oil. Or oil palm. And here um, also uh, yields of, of rapeseed. What we see here is also a very big difference in systems. We have systems like Canada and Australia with also much lower intensity and also much lower yields. Um, we see here Germany, France, UK, much higher yields as well. And uh, at least from our data, we see that, um, yeah, our UK farms, they have a slightly lower um, yields than the German farms. Um, I, I cannot tell that if that's true for the whole country, but at least for for the old farms we follow, we see a panel of yields of roughly one ton if you compare to to, to producers in, in, in Germany. Uh, and here, just to also to, to show some of, of the difference here, if you look at nitrogen input, you see the difference, and that's why it's a much more intensive system. And uh, that also could be something that will be important as soon as uh, the, UK or the European Union, Union moves to more regulations from nitrogen, then we might have other problems in, in rapeseed as well. Um, we don't have a rapeseed in Russia so far in our typical farms, and, but what we have here is Ukraine also being um, a mixed picture of, of very high, this, this first farm here, it's a very, uh, very um, Western type of, of management, so very high yields. And you also have this difference across types of management you see. Rapeseed costs, um, it's rapeseed prices, it's, it's much more stable. I mean, you see a, almost a flat line uh, across countries. Canada here with a, a price penalty is also because those farms are in Saskatoon and they have a much higher, uh, much longer transportation costs. And uh, yeah, as you see here again, uh, UK with the price, without the couple payment, it gets a very squeezed mar a margin as well. And uh, yeah, and Ukraine here having a very high margin if you compare prices to total cost. And uh, yeah, if we try to forget land costs a bit, because it's a bit harder to, to interpret, most of farms will be able to produce rapeseed with $350 per ton. So that would be a kind of a, yeah, an indicator for costs. Yeah, moving to something more familiar to me, soybeans. Now, soybeans, it's a, it's a much more concentrated market. Um, uh, and here we see Brazil, Canada, and US, and Argentina being very high yielding crop or high yielding systems, three, 3.5 tons per hectare. And then we have on the other side, Russian Ukraine, at 1.5 tons per hectare. Um, from from a Brazilian perspective, we are always looking at Russia and see how they develop in, in soybean production. Because, um, yeah, as a, similar to wheat, if they adopt the system to their conditions, it means having good seeds and, and right, uh, right inputs in the right time, they could be, yeah flooding the, 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 the market of soybeans as well. Our, for instance, Brazil, our main trade partner is, is China. So if Russia would be able to, yeah, to, to supply more soybean, yeah, we would be in a kind of challenging position here. Um, 
And as you see here, uh, for Brazil and US, when you compare soybeans, yields are very similar. If you compare costs, uh, Argentina has, again, as, as corn, very high um, efficiency here and very low production costs. Um, two years ago, we had our, national, our uh, annual conference in the US, and our partner from IOL, he told us that we should hope, Brazilians in, in the US, that the, polit the politics in Argentina stayed the same. So, and now we've seen some movements in this direction, and you see here that it could, they could produce or they could supply soybeans in a very low cost per unit. Um, what also comes in the picture here is the, the prices of, of soybeans in Russia and Ukraine uh, this, or different from, from, from wheat. They have similar prices at the world market and uh, it, that means that the margins for farmers are really good in soybeans. So soybeans has been a very profitable crop for most of the, of the Russian and Ukraine farms. And uh, one thing that I have to say here is the land costs in the US. I think that's not the big uh, news for people on the farm management side. They have very high land costs at the moment. It's coming down, but it's still very high. And that has a very strong uh, penalty for their competitiveness uh, while supplying to the world market. Yeah, um, as I was asked also to give some um, insights into Brazil, uh, that's a pleasure for me. Um, uh, soybean production, um, I was just thinking about that before because I just used one graph that is not from our data. And that graph was already used by Jack. So I, I'm very happy that I, I stay using our data. So what I want to show here is just, um, as Jack explained before, uh, most of the places we have uh, soybeans, we have a second, second season corn, which comes afterward. That will be similar from, from Argentina. They are also able to produce uh, two crops. So when we're talking about farm competitiveness, <coughs> we should look at this system as soybean plus corn, not soybean or corn, as is the case in the US. So um, as I said here, this, this, the, the graph on the right is the graph that uh, also was shown by, by, um, by Jack. And uh, you see here on, on the map, those are the regions where we produce most of our grains. Um, the dark colors shows dark production or more production, dark, more production, and um, yeah, the second season corn has uh, a very good um, benefit for farmers because you can use a lot of assets that you usually don't use during the, the the season or the second season. So you have your machinery, you have your employees, so you can use them to produce a different crop. The problem is that it's a much more a sensible or a sensitive crop to weather conditions. So as we saw now in this year, um, if you have two or three weeks of, of, of droughts, you might have losses of 30% of your yields. You know? So it's a risky crop, and that's also the reason why farmers don't invest so much. So just to give you a very practical example, most of farmers in this region in Mato Grosso, they will start seeding corn, and each week they seed, they reduce by half, for example, the input in nitrogen. So the idea is to try to reduce investments because if there is a fail, you might not lose as much as investment. It could also happen, what happened last year, then you have an amazing season and you have 7.2 tons per hectare of corn. So that is also in the both directions. For the market, I think it's a kind of tricky to, to follow this development because farmers are very flexible to, to move to different directions very quickly. They can decide tomorrow if they want to grow more corn or, or other follow crops. Yeah, just to show you some pictures from, from double cropping from the crop of this year, so corn, um, just uh, very recent data from, from this, this week. So uh, in Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso produced 30% of our soybeans and corn they have uh, a loss of yields of 30%, so two tons per hectare, and there is more than 170,000 hectares that were not even harvested because the, the, 
the losses were so so great that there was not they didn't make sense to harvest. So as I said before, it's a very good option for the technical side of for farmers. For the market, it's it kind of complex how it develops is very hard to for, forecast what will be the next season. Um, now uh, people, uh, it's, everybody asks why we grow corn so far from the port because the value is not there. Uh, a lot of the corn is used directly for farm as a cash flow income and also to, to buy inputs for, for soybeans. So there is a, a different type of, of, of uh, goal why people would produce corn. Um, yeah, a lot of the discussion we see and I see when I go to such conferences as this one is the comparison between wheat across countries and seeing, okay, Russia is, is the cost leading or they can produce very cheap, uh, very uh, uh, cost effective um, wheat. Um, but what we also like to do a lot because we have the whole farm picture, we like to compare what is the best crop for farmers in each region? Because that would, would lead to a situation where we can say, okay, uh, as we saw now in my presentation, Russian is, is one of the cost leaders for wheat, is the cost leader for corn, and is also on the market for soybeans. So if, if you look at on the region, what would be the crop that gives the highest returns to farmers? So here, uh, what I did here is um, what we usually call return to land, so it's total cost without considering land cost, uh, revenue minus total cost. So what you see here is dollars per hectare, because that's the return farmers would have to, to choose between alternatives. And what you see in red is rapeseed, and in green is wheat. <coughs> so what we can see here is that at least in this time span from 2008 to 2015, uh, rapeseed has been more, um, profitable for farmers, so it, it brings a higher return than, than the alternative crop that will be wheat. I'm not saying that everybody's gonna move to rapeseed because there are other technical is issues there, but it has been a very uh, profitable crop, so that's why we see also development in acreage following this, this idea. Uh, as you can see here in France and Germany, there is a big uh, mixed picture. Um, and it will also depend on the region because some regions have, as I was explained before, this ratio between yields of wheat and yields of rapeseed, they vary a lot. So, and for some regions, wheat is too, will be more and more uh, profitable than, than rapeseed. And here, comparing soybeans to other crops, what we see here is that uh, similar to rapeseed, soybeans has been more profitable for for the whole Americas besides Iowa. Um, so we see here it has, br has brought more, more returns for, for farmers. And, uh, and for me what's very interesting here is the right side of the graph. When you look at Russia and Ukraine, you see that um, uh, so far in those regions, corn and or soybeans is, are more profitable than, than wheat. So uh, we see a strong movement in this direction um, and that could also uh, explain a bit why people are moving or why farmers are moving also to, to soybean and corn uh, as it is some places more profitable than, than, than wheat. Yeah, those will be then my, my summary. Uh, I, I guess I don't have to read it, but just to be very, um, very, uh, true. Um, uh, as I say, Russia and Ukraine, they are cost leaders when it comes to, to producing outputs at, at the lowest, at the lowest uh, cost. Um, as I say, there is this, this, this penalty of, of yields for rapeseed in the UK that could also come in the discussion on how that influence the competitiveness of rapeseed in these European uh, areas. Um, as I say, double cropping for Brazil is a very interesting option and that's why we see the development we've seen since 2008. Um, and here I just want to mention again that the developments in Argentina will play a major role in our perspective how, how it changes the, the, the supply of, of, of corn and soybeans worldwide. And um, at least from our, our farm level comparison, 
uh, at the farm gate level, oil seeds they have been more um, more uh, profitable than 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 grains um, or than wheat. I have to say, and uh, yeah, and that would also explain the last year's uh, developments in acreage. Yeah, I guess that's all for me. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Oliver. There was some, some really brilliant detail to allow benchmarking comparisons to, to really mean something. And when we're facing competition, it is about actually doing something. And there's always something that can be done. Right, have we got any questions out? Uh, there's a question at the front here. Uh, thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, Guy Gagin, National Farmers Union. Uh, you, you're emphasising in your summary the, um, the lower costs in Ukraine and Russia, I think before land, generally. Um, mm. uh, is that because they pay less for fertiliser and less for ag chem inputs, less for seed? Or is there something else in there that, that we should be looking at to understand how it is that they can produce so cheaply? Yeah, yeah there is a, um, one of the big issues is operating, and so operations. They have much larger operation scales, so they can have much lower or machinery costs that, that other farms have. Um, there is a big issue here because everything here is also in US dollars, so uh, there is this devaluation of currency plays a major whole role here as well. Um, some of the inputs, as for instance labor and land, because those costs are also in there, they play a major role because as, as it's widely known, they have much lower land and labor costs. So there is, um, uh, there is a, whole set of, 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 um, of um, criteria that leads to this, this competitiveness. And uh, it would depend mostly in some regions you have different uh, items that are cheaper or, but uh, there is a lot of, uh, of, at least what we see when we, when we do a lot of panels in, in Russia, as um, some lack or there is still a lack in input sometimes for to reach in the right time farmers and also some lack of expertise in how to, to grow some crops. And that leads to a situation that it, there is a very strong uh, potential there, out there is too. You know? So if you see how the agro holdings perform and how some of the individual farms perform, it could even uh, get even more competitive. But it would depend case to case how the, which item uh, it's the chip or it drives the competitiveness. We have one last question there. Cedric Porter, uh, just based on your figures, if you were given five million dollars, <laughs> where would you set up a farm? Wow. <laughs> um, oh, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, yeah, I guess as, as a researcher, I would always say it depends. No? <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I see the, there is a strong um, movement also from people moving from, from Germany, for instance, to invest on, on the eastern countries, and also Romania, Russia, and Ukraine. Um, I'm not so familiar with, with this, these regions, but I would say they have a strong potential. Uh, there is a very, uh, we have one of our big partners in Ukraine, he's also a farmer himself. There's a strong, uh, that is not here, uh, a kind of cost they have over there, some how to, to find people to work in your farm and all types of going from uh, yeah, political favors and all things. So, but I think they have a very strong potential there. So um, I think if you, if you have land that has this black soil there and you could be able to set up a good infrastructure, that would be a good place to go. Um, there's still a lot of good places in Brazil, Argentina as well, as soon as you were able to solve some of the logistic issues. So I think those places, they, for, for the potential of gain you could have, that could be an interesting, but yeah. I guess if I have this question, I would not be here. <laughs> I, I don't want you under the impression that there's a lot of people in here with five million pounds. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Samuel. Thank you.